speaking and I was just there um, actually this morning and it was beautiful. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for uh, what I'm calling late spring, early summer in New York. Um, and I'm tuning in today from Southern California um, where it has been a cloudy white um, for much of the 2023 year. Um, and thrilled to be here for another uh, Business Bites session. Uh, the goal of today's conversation is really to talk about how great organizations optimize their build, measure, learn feedback loop. Um, and I'm going to spend some time before we get started uh, to too deep on that topic, um, really talking about um, the foundational concepts that the build, measure, learn feedback loop are, are built on and based in. Um, I'd love to hear from those of you who are live, uh, you know, what interests you about this topic, what inspired you to come, and I'm happy to customize today's conversation. Um, but we chose the topic um, theme, accelerate anything with real intention, because the build, measure, learn feedback loop um, is a concept that was really introduced uh, around the idea of venture scaled startups, but it can be applied to nonprofit organizations. It can be applied to internal programs within corporate organizations. It can be applied to um, change management strategies. The idea of build, measure, learn really can allow for the optimization of many concepts. Um, you know, as, as we talk about this, uh, I'm going to share a little bit for those of you who may not already know me about my background. Um, I'm Kelly O'Connell, and as Erica shared, I'm uh, an executive leader at Honest Access, the innovation consulting firm. Um, I also run 360 Venture Collective, which is an early stage venture firm that invests in venture scale startups, particularly tech enabled startups across a few industries. And I also am a certified nonprofit professional who's founded a now GuideStar Platinum nonprofit. And so I truly have experience with the idea of, of growth across uh, organizational types. As a consultant at On Its Access, I've had an incredible opportunity to work with organizations um, from Fortune 100 to global nonprofits to very small uh, emerging startups. And truly the ideas that are behind this concept of, of, of really customer-centered design, human-centered design, um, they can apply across the orgs. And so I'm looking forward uh, to sharing and having a great conversation about this today. Um, thank you for uh, each of you uh, joining and spending time. I know today everyone has a lot of choices with where they consume content, particularly content uh, related to business strategy. And so I want to welcome everyone. Um, and I'd love to know a little bit about where you're tuning in from, a little bit about your background, so I can customize and make today's conversation, especially the examples, as relevant to our live audience as possible. Now, I mentioned I was going to share a little around um, this idea of the concept, the foundational concepts that the Build, Measure, Learn loop are based on. And one is that there's the benefit of acceleration in, in, in concept to the startup or program growth world. And I want to talk about what it even means to accelerate something. So the, the textbook definition of acceleration is to increase in amount or extent. The secondary definition is to begin to move more quickly. And then in physics, this idea of acceleration is to undergo a change in velocity. A velocity. And why I love thinking about this, um, when I moved to California, I moved to California in 2007. I was working for a company um, that is that acquired Golden West Financial, um, and it was Wachovia Bank. And I came out um, to California from Boston, where I'm from originally. And in California at the time, um, I went from a very pedestrian Boston lifestyle to spending a lot of time on the 405 and 101 freeways and, and 
many others uh, along the way, but a lot of time in traffic. Um, and I thought a lot about this idea of acceleration way back then um, in the concept of work. Here I was in mergers and acquisitions, and we were thinking about how does um, a, a bank, a conservative, financially conservative bank at the time, um, how does that organization go through the process of of entering into a market that they hadn't really been in? They were largely an East Coast based market. They were largely um, a company that had savings as a way to get people into um, their higher kind of profitability segments of securities and on the secondary market. And, and they really weren't spending a lot of time um, at the time um, in this idea of uh, mortgage or mortgage lending. And so their acquisition of Golden West Financial, which was a company that was really based on uh, mortgage products. They even had their own mortgage index that they created, the COSI index. And they acquired this company as a way to accelerate. But I mentioned that it was 2007. And so timing matters in acceleration, the market and the type of market. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this um, here I was in a new place, spending a lot of time in traffic, what I like to refer to as windshield time, um, in an ideating stage, thinking, was this the right move for the organization? Um, I was seeing things that I wasn't used to seeing because it was an acquisition of a, a, a very different type of bank. Um, and I decided that I was going to learn how to skateboard. So during this period, I, I relocated and I knew that when I I wanted to get quickly from place to place in what I refer to as the pocket cities of the west side of the greater Los Angeles area. Um, and it wasn't easy to get around on a bike, but I saw a lot of people on skateboards by the beach. And so I love this image um, and this idea of acceleration because I got to spend a lot of time. Um, the fun thing about skateboarding, and I think it's a great analogy for acceleration, particularly in the first phase of the building measure learn cycle. Is it is a great example of, of how there's a lot of starting and stopping. And when I first learned to skateboard um, in Venice Beach, California, uh, I learned on this big, long cruiser board. And I thought that's better because um, this big, long cruiser board had more surface area. So I knew to be able to find my footing on the board. And I also knew at the time um, that that they were more stable. And so in my mind, a longer board for a skateboard was going to be better. What I wasn't considering were how many people walk on that beach path and how often sand covered that beach path. And so there was a lot of starting and stopping and um, a lot of me going, whoa, along the way. Um, and so as I think about... Um, this, this concept of acceleration, how it's analog, uh, analogous to this idea of, of startup acceleration is there's they're very rapid testing. I would test, you know, pump, pump, and then try to, to go until it would kind of stop. Um, and then I would start again. Um, and the, the goal as a startup is really the combination of these three definitions is to increase in in amount, what is working, right? So we talk about market traction to begin to move more quickly. So both through the measuring cycle, so making choices and in customer acquisition and in customer engagement and converting them from um, kind of customer lookers or early customer adopters all the way to customer champions and to increase really the velocity of growth. And so as an organization scales, it scales more like the starts and stops of when I first learned to skateboard initially. But as you begin to adopt the cycle and you begin to accelerate, you can actually undergo changes um, in succession and even simultaneously within an organization and still track and learn and scale. And so an enterprise organization has the ability to accelerate very rapidly once they identify fit. And they can identify the ability to scale based on timing and assets that they're able to contribute. And so that's a really important concept as we're talking about this. Hopefully, um, 
that kind of story of me skateboarding also makes sense a little bit as an analogy to all of you. Um, another way to think about this you may have heard about is sort of this idea of the hockey stick measurement, right? So at the beginning, there's a high cost um, of uh, initiation. It is trickier to hit velocity and it requires a lot more effort to gain your, your footing. Um, when you see professional skateboarders, which I am a long way from, um, they just have such ease. Their stroke to create movement, their speed, um, their ability to, to rapidly generate speed operate, operates much, much faster than even me at my best skateboarding capacity. Um, today, I've fully converted from riding a skateboard. In, in middle age, I've switched over to a Segway scooter um, where I can very simply push a throttle button and it allows me to move on that beach path a, a lot faster. Um, but you've probably heard about this idea of the sort of the hockey stick. Um, growth. The idea is that you want to be building in the areas where you're going to have the least resistance to gaining traction, where it'll cost the least to create conversions, um, and where you're allowed to optimize that energy output to result transition. And that's where measurement really starts to come in. But what is Build, Measure, Learn, and, and why did we start talking about it initially? Well, it's a concept that was introduced by Steve Blank. Um, some other people have, have claimed um, to have introduced it, but it was part of this sort of lean startup model. And the idea was really how do we go from a hypothetical idea, so this sort of leap of faith that we believe something should be built, that we believe it solves some type of problem, um, to a company that's operating at scale with traction, with customer success. And in a way to get there is to create a continuous cycle that allows us um, to understand what we're building, why we're building it, and measuring, sort of incrementally testing that along the way. So as so we go from Steve Blank's sort of lean startup idea, another way to think about this um, is that the build, measure, learn process is a feedback loop. It's a loop that begins with an idea, um, and you're basing that idea on a theoretical customer. So typically, if we want to apply it to a startup, just to use that hockey stick concept, the, the idea is I, I've identified a gap in the marketplace, a pain point, a problem that I'm attached to as a founder that I think is being underserved by the current market landscape. And I think that other people also experience this problem. And I believe that if I solve this problem, there is a market viability, meaning that I can solve it in a way where the potential for somebody to pay or acquire my solution outweighs the cost it would cost make me to develop that solution and that it's scalable over time, meaning it, it is something that creates a business model that allows for the effort it takes to solve the problem and to capture that initial sort of customer traction where it starts to create profitability allows me also over time to succeed. And so typically we have a customer in mind. When we think about building with customer empathy, I'm gonna come back to this slide. It's a really important concept because who we believe our initial customers are as founders sometimes isn't the initial customer. And this topic of build, uh, measure, learn, being accelerate anything, um, I also want to give an example of how this can apply to an internal organizational program. So the work we do at On Its Access, we're often working with enterprise companies, so Fortune 1000 companies and nonprofit organizations. And when we're working with those companies, they don't always have an external lens. They're not always out looking and saying, hey, I'm thinking about creating a solution for an existing customer segment or creating a solution for um, 
a new or adjacent customer audience. Sometimes the innovation work that they're doing is about internal employee retention, for example, or it's about a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. And they're thinking about their customer as an internal customer. And this build, measure, learn feedback loop can absolutely apply to that type of internal program development just as well as it applies to that startup founder who's thinking about, hey, I have this idea, a pain point that I see in the market that I'm really passionate about solving, and I'm going to go out and attempt to uh, discover if there's a market viable product that I can take to market. And then I'm going to learn with the customer. So it's not just about measuring based on a purchase measurement, but it's about truly engaging, having that human-centered design lens to understand through qualitative and quantitative study, is this the right customer? Is what I believe I'm solving for the highest and best use for the customer that I'm solving? Do they also use the product that I've designed in the way that I believe they'll use it? And what do they need next? How do they help me create a culture of continuous innovation with the solution that I create? And that's this cycle. So when you think about the brands that I represent, representing on its axis, on its axis was designed by Shelly Icona, our founder, really looking at the 360 degree representation on both axes of any problem that was being explored, whether that was an internal or external lens. So it's really taking this build, measure, learn feedback loop and thinking about it as a horizontal analysis of the problem and a vertical analysis of the problem, looking all the way around the cycle to determine how do we create scale? And this idea of acceleration really comes behind the idea that we wanna create a scalable solution. We don't wanna just build an internal program for five members of a 50,000 person organization. We wanna build a program if it's an internal program that can be adopted and deployed in a recurring basis so that we're getting a great return on investment. And so a fundamental concept, not in the language of Build, Measure, Learn, is this idea of improved ROI or cost benefit analysis as we undertake this idea of going from concept to deployment how do we make sure that we're doing it as cost effectively with the highest target audience benefit as possible and so as we look at this we look at this as an idea of going from really this idea stage so the hypothetical i've come up with a kind of key principle concept. And I'm then going from that kind of key principle concept, I'm going out and I'm saying, who is that hypothetical early adopter customer? And what's an adjacent hypothetical customer? And can I test them? So introducing this idea of A-B testing. Do Have I really thought through from the customer lens, this idea of, the problem and how they'll be using it. And then I do sort of this idea of determining what success looks like. And so I set that out and I go, what does success look like for that program? And I'm going to use the lens of, of nonprofit for a second, um, because oftentimes when we think about that nonprofit segment, we think about um, cost being a critical element. And I would argue that whether you're a Fortune 100 company or a bootstrapping startup founder or a nonprofit organization, having a lens of fiduciary responsibility of cost benefit analysis is beneficial to all of those organization types. And so really thinking about how will we measure success for this idea of what we're solving and building in those tests is really important. So we go from this idea stage, the hypothetical, and we create room and space for it. And we create it in a structured way. So when we're doing this work, we have a phase of the work that we're doing where we're ideating. 
And then we go into what's the theoretical build? What would it take to create an MVP, a minimum viable product where we could go out and test? And sometimes that minimum viable product is a slide that looks like this, where we could say, is this a pain point? And when I show you this image of how I'm thinking about solving this, how do you feel? And testing that across a few theoretical customer audiences so we can determine who those high potential early adopters might be. And sometimes it's a different type of early adopter. So using that nonprofit lens, because I think most people, when they think of a nonprofit, it's easy to think about cost being a really important and controlled environment for a nonprofit. And we spend a lot of time in the nonprofit world thinking about fundraising and thinking about how do we make sure that any program that we develop is going to be mission aligned. So it makes sense for who we are as an organization, the audience that we really deeply know that we're serving because it's part of the nonprofit culture. So we're really thinking about a fundamental audience as a nonprofit organization. And then we're often thinking about, and how will I make sure that, that I can continuously provide this program and that this, this type of program um, will benefit our intended audience enough that it's worth allocating resources because we often think about the financial cost of a product, but there's also a resource, a, a employee energy resource that's expended on developing new programs um, and, a, and a pure operating cost to deploying those resources and allocating them to new program or new product development. So thinking about the build, measure, learn idea around this idea of a nonprofit, it can really work well in the nonprofit space. So oftentimes a nonprofit organization is designed around one initial program. So Let's say it's a health equity nonprofit, like Start Giving Local, the nonprofit that I that I originally founded. Um, Start Giving Local, I founded um, to solve my own problem, which is oftentimes uh, something that uh, founders of both nonprofit and early stage startups do. They solve a problem that they're passionate about. I was an endurance athlete. Um, that enjoyed fundraising for other nonprofit causes. So I thought if I'm going to run a marathon, if I'm going to ride my bike 100 miles, if I'm going to do an endurance triathlon, I'd like to do it on behalf of a cause I'm passionate about. But many of those cause-based organizations that I was fundraising for, Team and Training, MS Society, um, they had a minimum donation amount that you had to raise to participate in the program. Oftentimes it was somewhere between $2,500 and $3,500. And I noticed that it would take those organizations a ton of volunteer and staff resources to have a team participating in these endurance events. And I thought to myself, wow, I'd love to do many of these a year, but I can't just keep going back to my friends and family and asking them to support my fundraising causes. And so oftentimes, and it wasn't just for me that I was experiencing that, I saw a lot of people that I would participate in these events with, they would participate in three to five sort of races or endurance events a, a year, but they would do one maybe two on behalf of charity each year. And so oftentimes, and I also saw people who signed up, but didn't ever get to race day because they didn't hit the minimum fundraising goal. And so the idea that I was trying to solve was other people experience this. The nonprofits do this because they like it as a fundraising channel. It's a great way to engage um, potentially new people to be passionate about their causes, but the ROI to run these programs was only for the sort of most established nonprofits and took a ton of time and resources for the organizations. And so um, it, it wasn't as efficient. And so I launched Start Giving Local to solve that problem. I thought, I'm going to find a way to allow endurance athletes to fundraise on behalf of any event that they're participating in with no minimum fundraising 
minimums, they can support the causes that they're passionate about. So sign up for the Orange County Marathon, sign up for the New York Marathon, and support world hunger. And we would help them by deploying that out um, in partnership with local nonprofits. And that today continues to be one of the program segments that start giving local runs. Um, but we realized as an organization that that wasn't getting to the root cause of this, this idea that is behind and underlying our mission, which is really about health equity. And that's about financial health. It's about physical health equity. And it's about mental health equity. And so we've since launched several programs in support of other versions of health equity. But we wouldn't be able to do that without a lot more um, volunteers and without really deeply understanding which elements of those problems we wanted to solve. And so anytime we launch a new program, we run through this build, measure, learn cycle. We think about um, what's the problem that we're trying to solve. And we, we think about who who's going to be served by it. Um, we think about what will it take to deploy this in one market? And then what will it take to deploy it at scale as an organization? And then how do we measure so that we can report back to our donors and so that we can make sure that the program is actually creating the change that we want to see in the world? And from that, we have this continuous learning with each time we're launching a program um, that we're allowed to then build on and use for other programs. We understand our customers more deeply. We understand and don't have to do the same types of tests to understand how, for example, athletes um, are engaging and signing up for new races, how they think about their training plans, because we learn. And so maybe we explore, but we're able to make quicker leaps of faith as we launch new programs because we're learning in this cycle about how our customers, how who we're serving, in this case, um, the volunteers who participate in our programs and the other people that we're trying to reach that don't yet today participate in our programs, we have a better understanding of greater empathy around them. So now that I've shared these examples, these foundational concepts, I'm going to come back up here. I'm going to give you a chance in chat um, to just share with me, just in chat, if you're here with me live right now, um, any questions, if you'd rather raise your hand and ask a question live, um, just about what I've shared about these foundational ideas um, before I, I step forward and, and talk a little bit more about um, how other companies are doing this well. Any questions at all? I don't see anybody raising their hands. Susan, if you want to unmute your mic, I'd love to. Uh, invite you. Um, I'm trying to understand everything. This is all new concepts for me. But when I start, I have an idea that I feel I feel I can fill. Uh, I have a passion about something that will help many people, um, young people. And so I say, I I know this will work. And I know the market that I have to target. So you're talking about this concept of learn with customers. So I'm already doing it for free and I'm learning how to do it. And the feedback that I get says it works, it's helping. So now I'm ready to take it out and try to charge or make money on it. So it will continue to help people with a wider scale, okay? Yep. So um, I there are a couple of ways that I can do that. Um, so I don't know how much- This I is very helpful. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share three questions that I would have that might help other people understand the build, measure, learn cycle. So um, most people who start do exactly what you're saying, Susan. It's what I would say is the most um, resource heavy version of the build, measure, learn cycle. So this is often the case, particularly with service and consulting business. Um, they go out and they do it free with a beta group. 
um, to sort of test it with a small group, but they tested the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my first question would be, how did you determine the audience and how are you thinking about the audience that you're serving? Okay, so I'm a pediatrician okay. and the audience are my patients. And I figured this out because the post pandemic closure of school, we were experiencing a lot of school phobia, not able to go back. And when I mm -hmm. examined that further, I found it was because they were unable to read, unable to sound out words, sound out letters. And so as a result, they were asked to perform in school and it was very stressful for these children. And if mom didn't have a tutor that they hired, they were falling behind. Mm -hmm. So I started in that way and I found that from my free, from my, my development, my screens that I, questionnaires I developed in my office, I found it wasn't just the post-pandemic closure, but they were kids that took a little longer to hear the sounds or process them and use them for decoding or words and reading. And so I said, hey, it's not just a post pandemic closure. It's just that we need to recognize there's some kids that we need to work a little longer with. So now I'm trying to reach out to the school districts, present my data and say, look, I'm willing to train your teachers or teacher's assistants to identify those kids who need early intervention, as we call it as pediatricians. In my office, I use the parents. And if it's really bad, we move on to referral for speech or occupational therapy, right? That's great. In one to three months, I've got excellent results. The children score 100 on the questionnaire just from a simple intervention at home. And those that are, need more, we go three months. So now I'm trying to gather my data and get it published in a local journal in pediatrics so I can teach other pediatricians. And that's another market. But this is great. I'm going to pause you for a moment, Susan, because you talked about something twice now that I think is a really important step. Um, and in you have a unique element because you who you're serving is different than your customer audience. And so um, you have a build, measure, learn test right now that you can do around um, your go-to-market strategy. So you've conceptualized the value proposition and that's the foundational place, right? What is the pain prop point? And is there enough of a shared pain point with enough of an audience that I can create a solution that brings value to that audience at a rate that makes sense. That's step one. And you validated that. So you did a build, measure, learn loop that says there's a problem. And it's not just unique to COVID, but there's actually an audience um, that regardless of this moment in time can be served by this. And so that was an observational learning from your initial hypothesis that you then tested and you're testing. And so that's great. But you also have this other build, measure, learn loop test that you're doing which is around your go-to-market strategy. So mm -hmm. thinking about, do I sell to the school district, the solution? Am I doing this as a solution that's B2B to other pediatricians? Am I selling to my mom groups? And so you have to create a measurement for yourself around the model and how the business model scales with each of those elements your ability, like what you would need in order to be able to serve that audience at scale um, and, and what makes sense, because you may end up selling to all of those people, but which one you go to market with first will be determined by your go to market test and thinking about ordering it in the right way to create an authority sales approach. If you already know it's being deployed in the school system, is it easier to sell to the consumer or parent? Or if parents are already widely asking for it, is it easier to sell to the school? You need to ideate to think about what the questions are that are blockers to you being able to grow. And so it's this fun experience. That's why ideas are at the, start, the top because you're thinking about who am I serving? And you're thinking about 
you kind of put together like a brainstorming sheet of all of these ideas. And I don't want you to think that if you go down one path, the other paths aren't possible. It's okay. just you're, you're identifying what's the path of least resistance um, so that you can create traction and, and start to create some of the testimonials you need to be able to scale. And so building out some of these tests, thinking about measuring impact, um, the other element about this is learning with the customer. And so you said they're scoring 100%. And now mm -hmm. I question, um, is that a customer net promoter score? Like, how did you decide that, that what you're measuring is the right measurement? Okay. Um, and, and so that becomes the question of learning with the customer. So, so often as a founder, particularly founders solving a problem you're really passionate about, you're certain, right? You're certain, I know the audience, or you're certain, like, I know what should be measured. But going out and checking with the customer with an unbiased lens about what's keeping them up around fear with the, the student learner going back to school, what's keeping them up if it's the um, school uh, about it, with a non-leading question is one of the things that's the best thing you can do in that learning with the customer. And so taking that third party perspective of not building a quantitative survey um, or a net promoter survey that's only measuring the things that you think are valuable about the product, but creating room in that learning experience to find out what's in your blinders, um, to help yourself as you go into the next stage of ideation. And you can start anywhere in the cycle. Um, you know, you may be starting if you're a corporation in learning with the customer before you go into ideating what your next programs are. You may start if you're a corporation thinking about an internal product, you may be thinking about or an internal program. You may start with just listening in on the ERGs and inviting them, employee resource groups to do a presentation to you on the topics that are most important before you even think about what types of programs should be developed. Um, so you can start anywhere in the cycle from where you're at, um, but those are the like examples specific to you, Susan. Those are the three questions that I would ask for each of the stages to really think about how the build, measure, learn feedback loop can be helpful. Can you give me an example for, for what I've been doing to be exact, that I'm not missing a kid that gets 100 the first time, in three months, I call the mother and ask for the report card because I want to make sure I'm capturing yeah. all the problems. So there's some kids get 100 the first time. I call back. I say, what's your report card? How the child is doing reading? Those right. kids that are not doing well, I see back and retest. I give the mother advice as to how to fix it and see how they do. So can you give me an example um, I was thinking of going to pediatric group, but yeah. I'm a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics and their goal is we've got to test this. I have the data and we got to publish it and validate it. Yep. Okay. I got so it. Here's, I got to here's what I would say. I would say um, you just gave a great example of leading with the test. And so, and that's okay. There's no criticism. Those things are important, but what you're measuring is what you want to learn. And it's supporting the value that you believe that you're bringing. I would okay. encourage a focus group um, comprised and you might do it in three separate sessions, um, but try to find insights across the focus groups. But I would do a focus group of pediatricians, a focus group of teachers and a focus group with parents, some that are in in, already in your program, some that aren't. Um, and I would have some with student learners that are school resistant or maybe experiencing some disciplinary problems and maybe some that are high achievers um, to, to really validate that your product is serving the best and only first audience. Um, that's an example. My focus groups I would do listening. I would say, how beyond the report card? Here's here's something I'm doing. I'm testing the report card. Teachers, what are other ways that if a student is experiencing fear around school that this might show up in your classroom? How would you measure it? Mm -hmm. um, what are other causes? Um, just to try to get those insights from them um, and then build your measurement cycle. Um, you might see it in 
acting up. This isn't my specialty. I have zero early childhood education experience. And so I should say, um, other than uh, having been a student myself and, and doing some projects with some nonprofits that serve in this space, it's not my strength. Um, but but I'm guessing, right? That like some examples that I would that I would pursue in a focus group with this audience. Um, and I would so so I would conduct that focus group. I would look at insights, and then I would try to develop from those insights um, another market test. So I would test maybe a sentiment, a conversion. So I would put up a landing page with my program, um, and I would test with some you know outreach directly to parents, some outreach directly to teachers to see who who might show up to a, a micro workshop on this topic um, to try to get some conversions, just to try to start to understand the audience. That would be an example of a build, measure, learn um, test that you could conduct around go-to-market. Okay. I see what you're saying. Uh-huh. Great. I've been invited to present my data and my my questionnaires to a large school district. Great. So that might be a focus group right there. Absolutely. So presenting that um, creates some room for qualitative, um, you know, here's observational. So create some room for them to tell you about problems they're experiencing post-pandemic in the classroom. Just open-ended, don't lead them. Um, see if there's something that they come up with that might be an even bigger pain point that's a blinder area for you. Um, would be a great example. Um, and then, you know, a good quantitative, a survey of that audience afterwards, um, where you get to actually measure their sentiment around a solution. Um, do they have the bandwidth? What barriers might you, you not be thinking about right. um, to their being able to adopt the product? And so these are the ways that we can use this. And I love your question. So thank you so much for engaging with me around this. I just want to check in and um, see if our dialogue is creating any other questions for anybody else. So let me just take a, a quick check. Nobody else is raising their hand right now. Um, so coming back to you for just a moment. Okay. Um, does, does that... Does that answer for you enough that we can move forward? Any other questions about the concepts? No, I think, you know, I, I'm very excited about meeting with this very large district with the head of education. Um, I'm presenting. I'm very excited about it because they're very interested in this because they want to implement it in, in their schools. Um, and now the question comes up. If they like it and they want to implement it, how do I charge for this? What do I yes. do? Help yes, me. that's Help amazing. Me. So that's another type of test, right? So it's the market <laughs> viability test. So, so you have to be careful. And why why the, the build, measure, learn loop is so wonderful is you have to know. Remember I was saying at the beginning, you want to go from your idea, the pain point that you want to solve. You want to know what your non-negotiables are. You want to know, um, you know, how much of my time do I want to be spending on this, solving this problem? Um, what is my kind of path to solution? So how do I measure success, which might be different than what the market might measure? Do I want to create a venture scale product? Do I want to just create something that's a, a nonprofit program that I can do on the side? Do I want um, so you have to answer those questions? And that's part of your business model that you're thinking about. And then you have to think, Based on the business model you decide, you know, do you have a strategic partnership and do you, you know, think I am going to create this and I'm going to, you know, success for me means getting one new school district to adopt this a year for the next three years. And that's, that's speed. To me, that's a cadence of success for this type of program because I only want to work on it myself and I don't want to build out a whole team of people. Um, success for somebody else in their business model that's achieving that might be, I want to simultaneously launch my commercial product with my kind of white label district product at the same time. And I want to be able to build a team and I want to finish this year with a hundred employees, 50 in each of those programs um, with a 
a, a totally scalable product. That might be, you know, if uh, an educational provider launched this program, um, that might be their dynamic for success. And so I can't answer that just on this type of a call, but what I can answer how you price it is based on your business model design and your measurement of what success looks like for you. So if your measurement of success, as is the case with many nonprofits and many early stage startup founders, is I want to get to this revenue marker. I want to get to this profitability marker this year. Then you backtrack from that. I want to get to 100 customers. I want to get to $2 million in annual recurring revenue, whatever that measurement, the financial measurement of success is, this is often the traction success um, mm -hmm. metric. Um, then you back out the that with your, what will the market tolerate? And what does the market tolerate based on margins? And what is the market average? So the compound annual growth rate for the industry, the total attainable market size, um, there's this idea of scarcity and demand that really comes into this. So these are big picture concepts. And so um, as we're thinking about all these sort of big picture concepts, um, you know, the fundamental backbone of this is you're going to determine how it's priced based on who you're serving and the value your product brings the market you're serving and how scarce that is and how important it is to gain speed with that hockey stick. So if you want to have slow growth, you can afford to have higher margins um, and serve a very small audience. If you have a very competitive market space that is um, you're just ahead of the curve on serving, then you probably want to get to market leadership more rapidly and you may be able to price it in a way where you have a smaller margin with a higher adoption level. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lower barrier to providing high value to your audience. So it's those things in tandem that really start to come into play. And so I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to show something here. Um, this idea, the new startup, the new program, um, you know, it's about your effort of doing business. Um, and it's about your determination of scale. So as we, as we think about, um, your kind of your business specifically, you are in an interesting situation because you could, um, Did she freeze? What happened? I don't know. She froze. She yes, I believe she has problem with connection. Can oh, you hear me? Hello, Julio. How are you? Hi, Susan. Nice to meet you. I see nice. Kelly has some trouble with connection. I think so. Mm -hmm. Should we? Um, I yeah. So what should we do? Get back on. Yes, you need to wait. She will definitely will connect. Somebody, oh. Erica from Hannah House uh, from Palo Alto, yeah. she's 